and uh, yeah. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Maxim, and today I'd like to tell you about an MVVM app design uh, adopted to work with multiple. Uh, well, currently it's both uh, UI frameworks on iOS. So uh, let's get started with today's agenda. So we're gonna talk about uh, how to transition from UI kit to Swift UI, maybe even vice versa, if there is such a need. And um, as well, and also we're gonna talk about uh, why is MVVM a great architectural choice for that. Um, we are also gonna introduce a state management um, uh, that is a um, that can be used to extend an MVVM for our task. Uh, we would also see how the state management allowed us to create composition complex composition layers of views uh, as well as the business logic layers. Um, yeah, finally, I'm gonna present some abstractions of the above mentioned ideas. Uh, as well as, of course, the code examples that we all love. Uh, so let us begin with the frameworks themselves. Uh, as you hopefully know, there are two main UI frameworks in iOS that have been developed by Apple to be used on their platforms. That is excluding, of course, the popular uh, third-party frameworks. Uh, so the first one being the tried and true UI kit. You can see the key aspects of using it on the screen, as well as the Swift UI, a more recent and the declarative framework that Apple is working hard on improving. So in the future, more and more people will be able to use it um, for their tasks, including the more complex ones. So the goals we are trying to achieve with our approach would be simplicity. Simplicity means a readable and compact code that is easy to understand, um, as well as easy to find a particular part of it, for example, to change it or to debug it. Um, extendability is a easy way to replace existing elements with the new ones uh, by not uh, breaking anything uh, in, in the process. An, import, uh, an important property of extendability is a loose coupling uh, that when achieved allows the object to be less dependent on each other to simplify the extendability. So another great uh, goal would be uh, the reusability. So that is kind of obvious. We should be able to reuse the components in a modular way uh, and also we should be able to inject them across the app when, whenever they are needed. So it is also important to have an injectability for the testability, uh, as especially if, uh, especially if we want to test the objects in isolation um, uh, that follow the single responsibility rule. Last but not the least is the stability goal. We need to make sure that all components are less prone to bugs, uh, work as they are intended to, and are highly cohesive between each other, but not in a way that violates the loose coupling rule. So the cohesion should be high and the uh, coupling should be low, the general rule uh, of a great architecture. So all of those goals can be achieved by using a model view view model architectural pattern. So why exactly do we choose MVVM? To begin with, it provides a clear separation of UI logic from the business layer. It also utilizes data bindings, which as you would see later, are a very convenient approach to connect the two. MVVM also allows uh, uh, 
us to work well with the both framework we just talked about. Moreover, Apple has developed SwiftUI with exactly MVVM in mind. And among the existing projects, including ones written in UIKit, it is one of the most widespread and popular frameworks. So there are a lot of developers who are familiar with it, at least to some degree. Um, the key aspect to remember with MVVM um, is that in um, UIKit, the view controllers are actually the ones performing the uh, responsibility of the presentation logic, and thus they are a part of view layer as well, not a view model. There are, of course, things to keep in mind while working with MVVM. The first one being the routing. And VVM doesn't provide any instruments to control the flow across multiple screens by default. Uh, so you're free to implement it in any way that is convenient for you. Nevertheless, the most common solution would be to add an extra layer co called coordinator. We're not gonna touch that point today uh, as that can be a separate topic on its own. So uh, moving forward, the ability of handling complex screens uh, with many components and bindings um, is also an important thing to handle in the MVM. Uh, we should really avoid getting into massive, uh, massive view model, which is similar concept to the massive view controller in MVC. Uh, then, uh, we should be aware of the side effects that are produced by the view model. Uh, the side effects are the collection of changes that view model performs on its environment. The simplest example of a side effect uh, is a newly created log. Some side effects might have an impact on the content of the screen, thus making multiple, thus creating multiple sources of truth. Uh, which may then lead to bug and uh, complications in uh, debugging. Uh, if we just follow the MVVM approach that is all over the internet, we would also find ourselves repeating a lot of uh, bloat code, um, which is especially noticeable in the smaller view models where the bloat code would take the most part of the class itself and uh, it would generally be flooded with the configurations. Uh, so imagine a view with like six uh, different callbacks stored in it. And uh, I mean, the view model with the six uh, different callbacks stored in it and uh, just a simple action updates. Um, so finally, we need to remember how the view hierarchy works in Swift UI. So the, in Swift UI, the views are simply a combination of a smaller views, uh, and uh, which encourages us to sometimes create a um, separate struct for uh, the inner views to make it more readable, separate, and reusable. Those smaller views uh, might also need to have a separate view model as again, they might be reused and uh, we should not repeat the logic in the general view model to make everything simpler. So in order to address those problems, we start by introducing the state management. The state management is all about taking the state the sc that screen is currently at and combining it with an action that is happening, which would result in a new state the screen should be updated to. Let's begin with defining what is a state. So a state is something that has properties and has an initial value for each of them. Its main responsibility is to define what the user sees on the screen. It also should allow mutations that would happen either after UI actions, for example, tapping some button, or receiving a response from the outside world, from the environment, uh, like for example, a local storage uh, uh, or a backend server 
finally, it is a binding. So every mutation of the state uh, should automatically be reflected in UI without any additional manual triggers. Now let us talk about how do we update the state. The state update can be done by simply creating a method um, by simply creating a method that uh, performs all the necessary mutations. Um, alternatively, there can be an enum that defines all possible actions and a single method that uh, goes through that enum and uh, provides a new mutation for uh, every action that can occur. So here you can see a single send method that handles a defined enum um, that is either adding or subtracting a value to our stored integer state. As for the bindings, uh, there are also a, a couple of ways to organize them. So the simplest would be to use a closure or a delegate and uh, combine it with a property observer. So with closures, we would have to pass the closure uh, as you saw on the first screen. Um, we need to pass the closure to the uh, view model and then call this closure every time the, um, the state updates. Uh, the similar concept would be with the delegates, uh, but uh, here we would have to confirm the uh, view to the protocol uh, that would uh, and pass it as a weak reference to that protocol object in order to allow the dependency injection. And uh, again, call this protocol with a corresponding method each time the update occurs. A more sophisticated way of doing it is with Apple's recently announced Combine framework, which allows us to create a publisher that encapsulates all of those meta in itself and allows various uh, useful tools uh, to perform on those observers. Finally, Apple in um, their Swift UI framework uses uh, property wrappers. So you might have heard about state, binding, and observed object. So we can also use the property wrappers to, to present that the view is subscribing to the view model and thus gets the binding. Um, so let us sum up how, uh, what have we achieved with the state management? So the state can act as a single source of truth and a single entry point for all UI updates we don't need to rely on anything else to draw the UI. We are able to easily pass data across the screens. With some additional efforts, we would even be able to bind the state updates of the previous screen to the previous screen so that the content would be consistent across them. That would be kind of tricky to implement with closures though. Uh, any state mutation is encapsulated, as we should avoid direct mutations of the state, which might cause some unpredictable behavior and untraceable mutations. Uh, we are also able to simply create a copy of the state object. This copy would be a snapshot of what has happened in the screen. Uh, it, is it can be very useful for the, for example, analytics purposes, or by a simple undo functionality when we have changed something and want to roll back to what it used to be. Um, there are also a very straight, there is also a very straightforward way of combining uh, the state management with MVVM as the idea of MVVM is basically the same. But, State management on its own, as I said, isn't much different from the classical MVVM. Rather, it allows us uh, to build a more complex structures that would lead us to the composition of multiple states and create and allows us to create hierarchies. 
So the simplest composition would be if we decide to add some already existing view uh, that has its own state to another screen. For example, we are an overlay. To do that, we can simply embed one view into the other while the state of the outer view would contain the state of the inner view as one of its properties. The similar thing would happen if we decide to have two of such views combined into a single one, though in iOS that is a more rare uh, thing to happen. The most commonly used, on the other hand, would be a composition of uh, would be the list compositions. Any non-trivial app ends up having one or two or maybe more table views, uh, which only have a single section uh, and provide a, an array of nested contents in them. There is also a more advanced version of the list composition, the multi-section composition. So that is exactly how the Apple de developed their uh, table view. Uh, so we are going to have a section or a, a list of sections, uh, each of which is a section, uh, is, is a list itself. So now, as we defined all of the core concepts that we need, let's get straight into the code examples. It is very important to know uh, that in order to avoid the bloat code, it would be very convenient to have everything abstracted out. So here you can see a simple abstract state that only has a required uh, initializer. As we remember, the state has to have an initial value. And an example of it that is implemented via enum uh, and the default value is would, would of course be idle. So it is not necessarily uh, enum that should be the state. The state can also be a struct. And if we want the enum functionality, we can either store enum as a separate field called status uh, or use uh, values as an associated values just like we used in the example before with the integers. So the view model would now look like this. It would be a generic protocol over the state. So each view model would have a corresponding state and uh, we should have a some method that would uh, set up the binding for us. So right here, we are using closures as an example. Um, on the right, you can see the example implementation of the view model. That is exactly how every view model would look like. And that is the bloat code I was talking about. So one thing to, one way to avoid it is to create some generic view model that would have all of this common code separated and in the bottom, you will be able to see the example generic view model that is simply empty because, well, it doesn't do any business logic. But whenever we want to create a view model, it would just be like that. And whenever we add a business logic to it, that is what uh, that would be the only thing that is located in view model. So when we open the view model, we can clearly see what it does instead of filtering uh, through that uh, bloat code. So another way, again, to provide an action is to define an action protocol and associate the action with the view model and create a send method. So here you can see a simple tap action and how it is handled. Here, it is very convenient to create a separate reducer object that would take the current sta uh, state, uh, take the current action uh, being sent to the view model and reduce it to the new state in a separate class uh, that would uh, allow us to better uh, separation and uh, result in better single responsibility, as well as would allow us to test this reducer separately. 
So let us now see how the view would look like uh, and start with starting with UIKit. So of course the views in UIKit are, the screens in UIKit are done via view controllers, as we said, and it should have a view model associated with it. So we can also add a default implementation for setting up the view model as the subscriptions would always be identical. One problem with it is that not every view component is a view controller. For example, if we would want to implement a list composition mentioned before, we would need a table view cell to conform to view protocol. That is why we change UI view controller to UI responder, which is a more basic class for the UI kit. Uh, so we can also create a generic view, just like with view models, that would perform all of the setups and create the view model and all of this stuff in here so that an example view would just be like an example view model from before uh, and only be uh, targeting what is actually the core uh, idea, a core purpose of this view, so presenting what is in view model. So here we are actually creating view model did update method that would uh, later be overridden by the subclasses. So that is how the example would look like. So no bloat code, no closures in here, and uh, as a bonus, uh, we now make sure that all updates happen uh, in uh, in a main thread that is an important thing to remember and we do not have a we do not get a retain cycle uh, because we are using a weak capture so even though you remember that you can sometimes forget to just type it in and get some unexpected behavior in there so when it's all separated to the abstract layer, it's much, it gets much robust. And uh, again, getting back to this slide, uh, you can see that the view model performs some updates, like here it does nothing actually, but uh, the all updates of the view are in view model did update method. Uh, while the actions are being sent direct, uh, while we can also see the actions that are being sent to the view model here. So in Swift UI, it gets much simpler. We simply create the view model, add an observed object property wrapper to it, and that is basically it. Um, we don't really even need a generic uh, view in Swift UI. Uh, basically due to the reason that we won't be able to um, subclass a struct. Um, and, uh, by and we do not need to provide a content to it uh, because that is exactly what we are doing here in the example view. So now let us talk about the compositions. So here you can see an example of how to embed one view model into the other one. So here I have created a separate protocol, a separate protocol, an embeddable view model that is needed for us to uh, set up that uh, across the screen uh, bindings, not only bindings to the UI. So you can already see how closures complicate matters here. Um, if, you're this, if we decide to use combine instead of closures, uh, we would actually not require uh, a separate embeddable view model. We would be able to embed every view model by default as um, combine allows us to have multiple subscribers to the publisher uh, by default. So the basic idea here would be the same. And whenever we, for example, create a list element, uh, we um, first of all, remove all of the subscriptions and uh, reset them for the new element so that we don't have, uh, so that we don't get any unexpected update from already freed up element or something like that. 
So the abstract list view in UI kit would be a little more complicated. So here you can see that we are only having one section. Uh, the uh, amount of rows in that section is defined by the amount of nested view models in our main view model. Uh, and here are all of the bloat code with uh, combined subscription um, with combined uh, subscription uh, passed into this generic list view so that whenever we create our own list view, it would be again clean and simple to use. So here is how the list view would look in Swift UI. Uh, of course, it's much more simple, uh, but that comes at the cost of configuration uh, abilities of the UI kit that we are we that we might lose in the process. For example, it would be a little bit more complex to implement a multi-section uh, list in a Swift UI. So, as a conclusion, we have created an architecture that has a clearly defined and separated business logic into an MVVM layer. And we get familiar with state management. So the way we can improve the MVVM to be more clear, more understand, uh, more easy to read and uh, to have less bloat code. We have created an architecture uh, that uh, can be easily used with both UIKit and SwiftUI, even at the same time without requiring any changes to it, which is very important for the project that would like to transition from one framework to another, or even use them in uh, a combination. Uh, so you, some views be implemented via UIKit and some views via SwiftUI. That's kind of common things, especially for the intermediate transitions. So we have also demonstrated how abstractions can impact our readability of code. Um, even though Apple doesn't really encourage us to create an abstract uh, of use for the um, abstract objects for the uh, views. Uh, all of those uh, concepts allow us to move closer to something called composable architecture uh, which has been covered many times uh, in the in our mobile community. And I think that is a great uh, framework, um, a great concept of reducing the state and actions. And uh, so what we have proposed in here is a kind of intermediate step towards the composable architecture for those who are not yet familiar with it. So here you can see uh, the few um, nice guides. So the point three, um, the authors of composable architectures for those who want to get more information about the composable architecture. And of course, uh, a few nice guides on state management um, from the GitHub. So yeah, thanks for your attention. Please feel free to ask questions. We actually managed to somehow end up in 30 minutes while I expected it to be 45. Yeah. Yeah, maybe someone has a question. Um, hi. Hi. <laughs> yeah. Hello. Uh, thank you for the presentation. It was a great uh, and very clear presentation about the architecture in mobile, mostly in iOS. And uh, I'm an Android developer. And all the things you mentioned that does make very sense for me as an Android developer. Um, but I think uh, you call this architecture MVVM, but I think it's not MVVM. Uh, MVVM, it's like, uh, because you have your model, we can call it MVVM, it's not right. Based on my experience, it's kind of MVI mostly because in MVVI, MVI architecture, the uh, communication between view and the business logic it's uh, and and view model that's the presenter class uh, it's the it's uh, via a, an estate an object that has all the things inside of that estate uh, 
uh, and that's more MVI, not uh, MVVM, based on my experience. That I want to mention this, uh, if I'm if I'm right or not. Yeah. So, like the main difference would be the actual data bindings. So, uh, in presenter, the presenter is responsible for notifying the uh, view that it has um, something to present. Uh, while the data bindings perform the updates like automatically uh, based on those property observers. Uh, yeah, the general concept is kind of similar. Uh, yes, yes. Uh, and uh, uh, that uh, makes sense to have a, an object and a state that's uh, it's like more MVI. Thank you for that. Yeah. Thanks for question. Maybe someone has another question. No, looks like no. Okay, uh, I would like to say thank you, Maxim, for your performance. And thank you. uh, thanks all for joining. Uh, you will receive recently, uh, shortly, sorry. Um, uh, the feedback form. Uh, 